everybody. Hey, let me give you some brownie points for reading all those all verses. Right. All right, all right. Yeah, that's good. So my name is Elijah. Um, I think I met most of you last week, but there's probably some of you I didn't meet last week. My, again, my name is Elijah. I'm from California, but I grew up in Hawaii, in Honolulu. Yeah, I went to like Lanakila Elementary, Conoco Middle School, Roosevelt High School, and I went to California for... There we go. And there we go. Yeah. I, so I went to California for school. I've been there ever since, but I'm glad to be back with my family, but also to share the Word of God with you. All right. It's, well, I fly back tonight. So before I fly back, I was thinking, okay, what kind of message I can leave you, all, leave you guys with? I was thinking I want to share one of the most powerful stories in all of the Bible and one of the greatest and most impactful interactions that Jesus ever had and it was with this one Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 see the story not only teaches us a very special truth that can change our lives but actually shows you what Jesus is like how loving he is See, many years ago, there was a man named by St. Augustine, and he said this, he said this, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Let me repeat that again. He said, you, he's talking to God, is you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That's what he said. See, this man knew that God had created him and all people for himself. And that we were meant to live close to God, with God. And apart from God, no one can find true rest for their souls. Because God is the creator. He created each and every one of you. And he created every Amen. one of you for himself. Amen. And apart from him, the giver of life, there is no life or no rest. See, this is why people go after things like money to fill them. Yeah, they want more money, more money, more money. Sometimes they want another person to fill them. They get Girls, guys, whatever it is, right? They're just trying to get more. They got more. They want power. They want to be accepted by people. They do all these things. Like even they do, they want all kinds of pleasures too, right? They want to drink. They want drugs, anything to fill the emptiness inside. So just keep taking it, keep taking it. But what Jesus is saying is you're drinking from the wrong fountain. You're drinking from the wrong well. And he's going to teach us through this interaction with the Samaritan woman, that you have to drink from the right well. His well. His well, that's right. Amen. And in our passage this afternoon, this long story, Jesus teaches this woman by this well in a region, in an area called Samaria. Okay? And he's teaching her where to drink a water that actually satisfies. So my prayer is for you, even after I'm gone, is that you drink from the right fountain. You drink from the right fountain because and you don't drink from the water that the world provides, but only that the one that satisfies the soul that comes from Jesus himself. So I'm going to divide our passage into three sections. I'm going to give you some applications at the end, and we'll call it a time. Sounds good? Amen. All right, Amen. good. So let's start. The first one is the journey. I want to tell you what's going on here. Do you see that in verse 3? He says, when the Lord learned of this, he left, so this Jesus, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. There's a reason why this is important. This, so this is, let's say this is a map, okay? <laughs> Judea is like right here, okay? And he had to go to this place up here in Galilee. What's the fastest way to go from here to here? Do you go around? Straight line, right? So it makes sense. He had to go. You know, if you're trying to go to Galilee, in the middle, there's actually a region called Samaria. So it makes sense. You just have to go there. See, but the problem is that Judea, the people, the Jewish people and the Samaritans, they're enemies. Right? They're, they hated each other. Right? The reason is that way back when, when the Jewish people were captured, they were captured by the Babylonians and like Assyria, another country. They all were exiled to another country. But there's some people who stayed there. Right? And then what happened was they started to marry with the other people of the other country. Right? And they started to adopt their like their like religion and worship. So once those Jewish people came back, they're like, you guys are not really Jewish. Anymore. You're all like mixed. You're not pure. That's what that's why they looked down on them. And then what happened is when you looked down on them, the Samaritans were like, forget you guys. So they enemies with each other. So they were trying to always avoid each other. 
not to talk to each other because they hated each other, right? So anyone, any Jewish people that was reading this Bible verse, they're like, he had to go to, he left, he said he, he had to go to Samaria. They'd be like, no way. Why did he have to go to Samaria? Because most people, what they do, they go around. The Jewish people, when they're going up or down, they go around Samaria. They don't even want to associate with the Samaritans. But Jesus says he had to go through Samaria. Question is why? Now we'll find out because there was a Samaritan woman there that he had to meet with. He had an appointment with this woman. She don't even know, but she, he had an appointment. And we'll see in the story unfolds, okay? So... What we find that is that there is a woman, this woman from Samaria, her name's not even there, but her Samaritan woman that he had to meet. And he went through the region of Samaria on purpose. See, when you go to enemy territory, what happens? Is this safe or dangerous? Dangerous, dangerous right? That's why people go around. But he went straight through. It don't matter what danger that he had to face, he had to go meet this one woman. See, this is a picture of what God has done, like big picture. See, we talked about this last week, whoever was here, that Jesus came down. So God, that Jesus came down from heaven to earth, a place where it's full of people that rebelled against God. No one seeked him. It says in Psalm 14 too, God has looked down on the sons of mankind and found that nobody was good and everyone was corrupt. So he's coming to a people that he created that don't even like him. Right? But why did he come? He came because he had to spread the good news, right? Last week we learned, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Ah, you guys good. Okay, you guys memorized it. That's pretty good, right? And then what Jesus did, even though it was dangerous, he came here, but he actually came to spread the good news. And what God has done, what the Savior he's provided, and actually died on the cross. Right? He died on the cross. And so that he would forgive the sins of all those who would believe in him. But look at look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. So he's coming up, but he comes to a town called Sakar, And he's tired from this journey. So from over here, like Judea, to go to Samaria over here, it's 70 miles. Did they have a car back then? No car. They walk. That's two and a half days of walking. Yeah. So Jesus, of course he's tired, but he's going there on purpose. You see, he's going there with intention. Even though it's tiring, it don't matter. Because the person that he's talking to, that's more important than being tired. See, this, is, this shows who Jesus is, right? He's loving. He's loving. He's willing to go through the hard stuff. All the kind of people in the world tells you that I love you, right? They all talk. Jesus is action. Got it? He's showing that by walking all the way here to meet with this woman. Look at verse 7. This Samaritan woman. He's just, so imagine this. He's, he's by this well, yeah? He's by this well. He's tired. He's sitting down. And all of a sudden, this one woman comes to draw the water. Seems like coincidence? I don't think so. Right? He was there on purpose. He was waiting for this woman. And this woman, we learn, she came to draw water actually at noon. Let me ask you, is it hot or cold at 12 o'clock? It's hot, like this right now. Do you, would you go and get water here, walk all the way out of town to grab water from this well? No, you don't usually go at 12 o'clock. It's too hot. You go early in the morning and you go with a group of people. Right? All the women would go together to grab water. But why is this woman all by herself in this hot heat of day? coming to grab water and we go find out why and Jesus begins to have a conversation with this woman look at verse 9 she's shocked that Jesus is talking to her she says you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman how can you ask me for a drink she's saying first of all I'm a Samaritan you guys hate us why are you talking to us and the second thing I'm a woman why like why are you talking to me remember back then all in the old days Women didn't get the right respect, right? They don't get the right rights. So for a man to be talking to a woman in public, that's shocking. That's shocking. But as this woman is shocked by Jesus because he's being friendly, he's asking her for water. He's asking a favor from her, giving her attention. And in verse 10, Jesus makes her curious of three things. 
Number one, what the gift of God is. Number two, who he is, Jesus is. Number three, he makes her curious about what is this living water. Some of you guys are listening right now. Like, what, is, like, what, what is this? Like she has the same feeling. He says in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What is living water? So living water is another way to say spring water, water that comes from the ground, right? That's where the source is, right? That's where you draw the water from. That's, he's saying, I would have given you living water, but you know what? She thinks she, what? What, what are you talking about? Yeah, what you I mean, you're the one asking me for water right now. I don't see, you don't have no tools to bring up the water. Sir, it's, she, she says, Sir, uh, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? All right? So she saying, she confused. She's saying, you asked me for water, but you're saying you can get me spring, like get me spring living water? And Jesus, look at verse 13 and 14 in your pamphlet. Jesus begins to unpack, to clarify what he means. He says, and this is what's important today. He says this, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Yeah, he's just talking deep right here, right? Deep. What he's saying, he's not talking about physical water right now. He's using the water to paint a picture of your spiritual need. Spiritual water. He's talking about spiritual water, that's right. He's saying... This water that he gives satisfies the soul. He satisfies the heart. The heart is the control center of everything you do. See, it says in Proverbs chapter 423, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. See, your heart is the control tower of everything you do. And whatever, he said, if you keep drinking the water that comes from the world, you will keep being thirsty. And what you'll try to do to quench that thirst and to fill your stomach, you're going to put things that don't satisfy. You still become empty. This is what Jesus is offering each, every one of you here. Every one of you is offering you this water, this water that satisfies the soul. Not only does he say if you drink the water that you will never thirst, he says that water will spring, will become a spring of water in you that wells up to eternal life. Amen. See, this abundance of water in you causes you never thirst. But what the Bible is talking about here is actually, it's promising you a gift. It's promising you the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. See, in a few chapters later, John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, Jesus is at this festival, and he says this again. He says this, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture, as the Bible has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, the Spirit of God, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. See, the Holy Spirit of God comes later in Acts chapter 3. So to John, he's saying, later, it's coming. But this, the water, the Holy Spirit of God gives life to each person. See, he makes a person's heart who is dead. He makes it alive again. It makes it beat for God. You see in Ezekiel 36, he said, I will give you a new heart. Right? God is going to give you a new heart so that it beats again, that it has life. And it also says that the Holy Spirit guides you. He teaches you. He makes you understand the Bible to go in the right way. See, the Bible is God's commands, right? God's telling you, I'm the creator. This is how it works. I designed it. I know what I'm talking about. Right? He's saying, go follow this. Right? The Holy Spirit helps you with that. And also, number three, it says that the Holy Spirit, it, it's God's seal of salvation on you. See, how do you know you're a Christian? If you have the Spirit of God in you. That's what he's saying. So he's giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is God's offer for each and every one of you. Listen to his offer again. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, Amen. the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Amen. Do you want this water? Amen. See, the Samaritan woman said yes. yes. 
Look at verse 15. So the Samaritan woman says, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, she said yes, but she, she didn't understand. She thought he was still talking about physical water. See, but what Jesus does in the next verses is lovingly show her that she needs to satisfy her spiritual thirst, not just her physical one. See, he says in verse 16 to 18, right after she says, I want this water, look what Jesus says. He says, go call your husband. Come back. And then she says what? I have no husband. And then Jesus says, you're right, you have no husband. And he says, the fact is you have had five husbands. And the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. That's a lot of husbands. Oh, that is a lot of husbands. Right? But look, Jesus knows supernaturally her past. Right? What he's doing is he's saying this because he's trying to show her this. See, the fact that she's had five husbands and the man that she's with not her husband is that she's trying to fill her thirst with a man. Do you see? She's trying to fill her emptiness by having always someone next to her. See, my friends, let me tell you. Your significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, they cannot fill you spiritually. They cannot, they don't complete you. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Jerry Maguire. It's like an old-time movie. It's the main character. You know, you guys, who knows Tom Cruise? Yeah. So in this movie, like he has this like this romantic movie, right? At the end. He finally like, goes to the girl and the movie says, You complete me. <laughs> Not in the real world. Not in the real world, that's right. That's just a movie. <laughs> See, that hole in your heart is reserved for God to fill. Not for anyone else. Amen. Amen. No thing or no person can ever fill the hole in your heart because that's reserved for God to do. Not first. See, God has created you for himself. Right? And what you have to know about marriage is you don't marry someone so they can fill you. Biblically talking, you marry somebody because it's an opportunity to love them as God has loved you. You're not trying to take, 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 take. You're trying to give, 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 give. give. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Right? That's so different from the world, right? See, you're putting marriage in the right place it's supposed to be. Yes. Yeah? See, look at... Um, and let me tell you before I move on is... See, if you put another thing or someone in that place that's reserved for God, you're going to wander aimlessly. You're going to be lost. You're going to be empty. And See, drinking that water from the world, even if it may be something good like marriage, that's not going to satisfy or fill you. But look at verse 19. She's just a bit spooked. That's right? a little scary, right? Imagine someone like randomly at the what? Randomly over here in the parking lot that sees you and tells you everything you've done. <laughs> she kind of freaked out a little bit. Right? She says, sir, I can see you're a prophet. And you know, what she does right here is something that many people do when Jesus brings light, their sins. When Jesus talks about their sins, this, what she's about to do is what many, many people do. She becomes uncomfortable and she quickly tries to change the subject. Dude, we just talked about she had like five husbands and she doesn't even have, like the man she's living with right now, she's she's going to talk about something else. She's going to be like, so in verses 20 to 24, what we read, she tries to talk about this argument that the Jews and the Samaritans have about where worship is. She's trying to say, change the subject. Don't we do that all the time? When the Bible or the preacher or a Christian friend or family they talk to you about your sin, or they talk to you, you probably shouldn't be drinking like that. You probably shouldn't be doing drugs like that. You need to get your life together, right? You need to get back, back right with God. What happens to you? You become uncomfortable. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. So what were you eating for lunch? Like, you're trying to change the subject. She's doing the exact same thing. She's trying to change the subject. And you know what? Jesus lovingly, she, he answers the question. Right? He answers the question, but he knows that her sin, her drinking from, a, from the wrong well, he wanted to address that. See, People try to put off resolving this issue of sin. They try to put it off of not being right with God with questions, with excuses. And they try not to answer this question, am I right with God? Am I yeah. been washed by his blood? Do I, am I truly saved or not? Am I really a child of God? They try to put off that question with whatever, whatever they can come up with. 
I've seen that in so many people. But do you know why I know that? Because I did it too. See, I don't know if you all know, but I'm actually Pastor Kim's son. <laughs> I'm, I'm Pastor Kim's son, so I'm the youngest of three. Yeah. So I grew up in the church. I grew up. I rarely miss church. Rarely. Even if I was sick, my mom would dr like drag me. Right? I was always in church. See, I grew up around Christianity. But you know what? As I grew up, I didn't want to become a Christian. Do you know why? Because I, to be honest with you, I didn't like Christians. I don't know if someone can like, like connect with it. Yeah. I grew up in the church, so I've seen so many things. And it, it was the people that just didn't want to, I just didn't want to become a Christian. See, when I saw some Christians growing up, I would see them in worship service, like raising their hands, They're all spiritual, all good. They're like, yeah, I'm on fire, you know, like all that. They walk right into the parking lot. They lose their temper already. They go into the kitchen, already yelling and fighting over food. And they go home already. They live worse than people not even Christian. And I'm sitting there like, I don't want that. I grew up like that. I don't want that. But here's what I realized. Two things. Because there might be some of you. You're not becoming Christians right now because of the people. Sometimes. And let me tell you two things that I have to face when I become a Christian. I realized two things. First, is that even though I saw problems with the Christians or the people that claim to be Christians, there was no problem with Jesus himself. No problem with Jesus. The more I studied Jesus straight from the Bible... Straight from the Bible. I learned that he was wise. He was loving. He was so merciful. He's so righteous, just. He's the leader that I can respect. He was worthy of me giving my life to him. He was here to save me. He was here to forgive me, not to judge me. We talked about last week. We talked about verse John chapter 3, 16 last week, but also 17. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him i didn't know that right because the church we talk about sin right i was just so uncomfortable man they're trying to judge me or something but that's not it sometimes you have to talk about sin so that you can get better remember we talked about when you go to the hospital how do you know if you're healthy you take an exam and when you learn that you're not sick you just go to the doctor you make you better easy makes sense right same thing that's what Jesus is doing when she's he's talking to this woman about her sin so that he can so she knows she needs him. He's trying to make her know that. See, what I've what I've learned is that there's no problem with Jesus. Nothing with him. See, imagine there's a, like a beautiful picture. It's so beautiful. What was happening is some Christian people were putting paint all over it so I couldn't see the picture. But once I figured out what the picture was, I was like, yeah, that's true. That's beautiful. I want that. See, when you look at Jesus, when you look at Jesus for Jesus himself, man, your life is going to change. Your life is going to change. And number two, what I learned about, see, not only did I see that even though there's per Christians had problems and there was no problem with Jesus, the second thing I learned is that even though I pointed fingers at these Christians for being hypocrites, I wasn't a good person either. I was a hypocrite too. See, it's easy to point fingers at others, but not easy to point them back to you. Yeah? See, what I realize is that Christians, they're not perfect, but true Christians, they've been changed. Little by little, sometimes slow, but sometimes fast, they look more like Jesus every, every day. They're not perfect, but they're on their way. Amen. Right? So we've got to give them patience. Right? They're on a process. Patience of virtue. Yeah. Just because you become saved at that point, you don't become like Jesus right there. Amen. All right? Slowly but surely. Amen. See? Amen. And also what you got to know is some people that go to church, they claim to be Christian. They're not even Christian. They've never repented and believed in Jesus. They've never gotten the Holy Spirit. They're not true Christians. So what I learned is you can't judge Christianity by people's performance. You judge Christianity by going to the person that is talking about Jesus. In the scriptures. That's what I did. I had to get over that. Right? Take off all the excuses you have for going to Jesus. Go to him. And find out for yourself. Don't let the people blot it out for you. People aren't perfect. We learned that last week. No one's good. Right? So let me ask you. How about you? What is keeping you from actually drinking the water that Jesus is offering you? 
What are the things that you're hiding behind? What are the things that you're pointing to so that you don't have to repent? You don't have to turn from your lifestyle and actually get right with God by believing in Him. Is it shame? You have a grudge against someone maybe? Maybe some person from a church hurt you before? That happens. See, but no matter what question or excuse you have, you still need Him. Your sins need to be forgiven. You need to make right with God. That problem is this problem, right? Between people. But this problem is still there. You, you understand what I'm saying? That's between two of you here. This one needs to be resolved, whether this is happening or not. See, if not for Jesus, not only can you not go to heaven, but you don't have the life on earth. You don't have eternal life. See, uh, look at verse 25. After being wowed by Jesus' knowledge of her past and his spiritual wisdom, this woman says, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Who knows what Messiah means? It's this like Hebrew word. I don't expect anyone to know. It's good. It means chosen one. Okay? So what, it, what it's talking about, this is talking about the promised Savior from all the way Genesis 3. From the Old Testament, thousands of years ago, God said there's a Savior that's coming. Right? This is... This, this Savior will come to save people from their sins. This man would be of God, know the things of the past, be wise and have spiritual wisdom. And as Jesus says in verse 26, he tells this woman, this random, looking like a random woman, says, the one speaking to you, I am the Messiah, I am He. See, this is mind-blowing. See, this, the Messiah, this Messiah who is the chosen one, the Son of God, the one foretold in prophecies thousands of years ago, had actually come. And she, just, all this like lady heard of was story. He's coming. He actually had come, and he, he was talking to her. So what's this seemingly unimportant woman from Samaria? Jesus had walked seventy miles on purpose to enemy territory. To reveal himself to her. Tell me that isn't love. See, what this says is God doesn't care whether you're rich or poor, doesn't care if you made mistakes, he doesn't care if you sin against him, but he does care if you come to him or not. See, that doesn't disqualify you. See, Christianity is not for the mainland people only. Yeah? It's not only for mainland people. It's not only for Caucasians. It's not only for Koreans. For everybody. That's why we're here. Even with the broken English, we're going to try because this is for everybody. This is for everybody. He said, everyone is thirsty. Everyone's equal like that. Everyone needs Jesus. And through this story, see, he's revealed himself to this woman and is so now revealing himself to you to each and every one of you here through this story, through this Bible, through His Word. He's revealing Himself to you and offering you the same water. See, what great love of God is that He will reveal Himself to someone like me. I mean, what good have I done, really? What have I done to really like, earn this? I haven't. I'm not perfect. You guys, you guys know, look inside me. No one's perfect. We all know this. We've made so many mistakes. I don't deserve, I never deserve God coming to me and revealing himself to me. What great love is he is revealing himself through, your, through his word to each and every one of you. See, what should be your response to all of this? Let's see what the Samaritan woman did, okay? Let's see how she reacted. There's two things. Look at verse 28. She first left her water jar. Okay? So she's going to leave her water jar. She's going to run off into town. But she first left her water jar. Remember, she was here to get the water, right? And Jesus is saying, if you keep drinking that water, you'll still be thirsty. If you take the water I give you, you'll never be thirsty again. So what she did is she left her water jar. You know what this symbolizes? Everything she's trusted in. Every other thing or someone that she's put faith in, she relied on, she kept drinking from that, she put that away. What God, 
he's telling all of you is, and what the Samaritan woman did is, she said, no longer will I draw from this well, from the, but from the well that is Jesus Christ. So for you as well, let go of what you rely on to fill you. The drugs, the alcohol, the men, the women, all the things you're trying to fill your soul with. He's saying again and again and again, trying to beat it into your head, right? Everyone who drinks this water is going to be thirsty, I'm telling you. He said, drink from the well I give you. And in you will become a spring. See, from in you flowing water. It's not you're just drinking a glass of water. In you it's dwelling up to eternal life. See, John chapter 17, 3 says this about eternal life. Says, Jesus says this, and this is eternal life. That they may know you, the one true God, and his son, Jesus Christ. This relationship with God, having the spirit and being right with him is what gives you life. Knowing the creator, you are made, each and every one of you, you are made for him. And he's saying, come back to me. I'm the only giver of life. You can try to find life elsewhere, but you won't find it. That's what he's telling. So what this woman did is, she realized this is this is the Savior. This is the one. This is the one that I've heard of and I've wanted. This is the one that can fill me. This is the one that I can give my life to and actually have eternal life. And what she should do? She left her water jar. She left it behind. This is what this is what your response should be. Let go of whatever water jar you're holding on to. Let go. What, what does she do next? She goes off running into the town to tell others about it. Okay, you guys got to realize. Remember, she's had five husbands. And the man she's with right now, not even her husband. How, how would the community, how would the town look at her? Promiscuous. <laughs> she's not pure. They all point finger at her. And what she do? she's going to run into town and keep talking to those people that are pointing fingers at her and says, look, look, come and see a man who told me everything I did. See, the shame and the ridicule, it don't even matter anymore because she found life. She's so excited. She's so joyous to find life that she's, going, she's willing to go even to her enemies and tell her about it. See, this is how you know if you truly become a Christian, if you've truly drinking this water, you're going to start telling everyone else about Jesus. See, imagine you have a favorite restaurant, right? If I asked you, what can I eat? Some people would be like, dude, you got, you got to go over here. Over here, they got the best food. See, we evangelize to people about restaurant. How about Jesus? Right? You evangelize. You tell other people about food. How about Jesus? Right? It's because you've never tasted it yet. But I promise you, when you taste that water that he gives you, man, you're going to leave for joy. You're going to leave for joy. And you're going to want to tell everyone else. That's what all the people from Korean church are trying to do. They tasted the water. They're saying, it's hot out here. Yeah. I mean, it's physically hot out here. It's hot out here. Take this water. That's what they're trying. That's all they're trying to do. But there's a saying. You can take a horse to the river, but you can't make him drink it. Right? But they're trying to, they're bringing you, they're bringing you to the river. To this fountain, they're bringing you. And that's God because they're obeying God. They're bringing you. It's up to you to drink it. Drink it. It's on you. There you go. See, this is my question for you. Do you want a water that satisfies? Like, Do you want? Are you thirsty? Do you want this water that actually satisfies you? The water that makes you drop your jar. The water that gives you so much joy that you're willing to share this with the rest of the world. Drink from the right fountain. Let go. You guys know what sin is entangling you. You guys know what it is. Some people, it may be drugs. You just can't let go. But if you can't let go, it's going to take you straight to death, straight to hell. You know this. Drinking. Fornication. Some people, it's pride. Some people, they can't forgive. And they'll keep that unforgiving heart. 
See, there's so many things, but Jesus is saying, there's life, right, there's this fountain right here. Leave your jar, leave it. Come to me, he says. See, if you realize that you need this water and you want this water, I got three things for you to do. Three things, okay? And we'll wrap up our time with that. Just three things. Number one, you have to be made right with God. As we talked about last week, for you to have eternal life, for you to be saved, for you to be in right relationship with God, you have to repent and believe in Jesus. And what scripture says is once you do, you actually receive the Holy Spirit. The very Spirit of God, that when you have Him in you, not just giving you experience, in you, will well up to eternal life. See, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the Apostle Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, for you to have life, you need the Holy Spirit. For you to be right with God, you need to turn, repent. All it means is to turn, okay? You've been living this way all your life. And may I remind you, because I've had to face this question, where is trusting you, where that trusting in your own knowledge, where, the, where has that led you? Do you have life? No, when I was trusting myself, no life. No life. I barely survived, but I wasn't living. You guys know what I mean. You survive, but you're not living. Right? You got to repent. And you believe in Jesus because when you believe in Jesus, He forgives your sins. Everything that blocks you from having that relationship with God, that sin, that penalty, that judgment you're supposed to get for doing all the bad things against God, He pays for it. With His love on the cross, that blood washes you so that you can be right with God. That's the point. Not so that you, oh, I got free ticket for heaven and I'm going to live however I want. That's not the point of the cross. The point of the cross is you were made to be with me. I made you for me. But you have rebelled against me. The sin now separates me from you. But look what I've done. I loved you so much that I sent my son into the world to die on your behalf. So that if you believe in him, you'll have eternal life. You'll be made right with me. Now you can be with me and I will be with you. And I will give you my Holy Spirit to prove you that. That's what it's saying. So you got to repent and believe in Jesus so that you can have a right relationship with God. Remember what that man, St. Augustine, said. You have created us, O oh Lord, for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So you have to be with him. And you can only do that by repenting and believing in Jesus. Number two, you read and meditate on the word of God. Okay? Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word of God, the Bible is the word of God. This is what he said. He's told his prophets, all these writers, that this is what he said. What happens is, when you read the word, he teaches you, number one, how to live. Guys, when you buy one table or anything like that, instruction manual comes, right? What happens when you don't listen to the instruction manual? Can't make the table. <laughs> You think you make a table, but you get a chair somehow. Like, oh, how's that happening? <laughs> right? See, God is the creator. He's the designer. He told you, this is how you live. I know what I'm talking about. I made it. All right? All he's saying is, I made it. Follow it. Okay? He's teaching you how to live. A couple of things that he tells you. Hey, don't drink from the wrong fountain. Makes sense. Right? Number two, what the Word of God does is, the Word of God teaches you who He is. See, you don't have to guess who is Jesus. You don't have to guess who is God. He told you. He told you what, who He is. He told you His message already. You can read it too. You don't have to wait for the preacher. You can read it too. Who, who's got a cell phone in here? Give me a hand. Everyone got a cell phone, basically. If you don't have a cell phone or anything... If you need a Bible, so let me address the cell phone people first. If you got one of these, all you need to do is download an app now. It's free. You don't got to pay for a Bible. You can just download one. And for the people who want a Bible but don't have one, ask Pastor Kim. He'll get you one. I promise he'll get you a Bible. 
But get into the word of God. Remember, Jesus says, this is eternal life for me to know God, the one true God, and his son. And you do that through the word, right? Because that's who he said he is. So not only do you have to be right with God, you have to read and think about, meditate, and chew on the word of God. But number three, you have to pray. See, all prayer is you're just going to God and you're talking to him. Okay? See, what's beautiful about prayer is there, God does listen. See, when you pray, the Bible says when you pray with the right motives, right? You will listen. It's not all just so I can get what I want, but that fellowship, that relationship. I'm not alone. See, if my parents, my parents someday, they go pass away. But it doesn't make me alone, because I got God. You see what I mean? See, when you go through trials of this life, there's going to be things that are just going to just knock you down. Yeah, you guys all taste all of that. Amen. It's just going to knock you down. But even if it's painful, you know how I can always be joyful? I got God. Amen. I can always pray to Him. He's there. He's listening. And the Bible says when you become a child of God, He listens to your prayer and He gives you the good things. The things that are beneficial for you. Amen. Which means sometimes when you ask for some things, He's not going to give it to you because it might not be good for you. Right? Like every good parent, right? It's so like, I had my niece, right? My niece was here last week, I think. But she all every day she wants ice cream. <laughs> every day she wants ice cream. Right? She just doesn't want to do anything. And grandma says, ice cream? She's like, ice cream. <laughs> ice cream. That's what I want. But you can't give baby ice cream every day. Right? It's not good for her. It's not good for her. <laughs> Same thing like that. God will give you the good things in that way. Not everything you want, but everything that's good for you. Yes. And you do that, you ask... You get the relationship. See, that's yeah. that's like side bet. Like that's a side benefit for me to get this. <laughs> but for me to have access to God, me talk to Him. That's what it is. See, that's why when I go to heaven, we're not going to be strangers, me and God. Some people they don't pray, so they're going to show up. That they never even talk to God, right? See, people, Christian people, they pray to God, right? They know they know each other. They talk to Him through the Word. So you got to do three things. Three things you can actually do. Number one, today, if you haven't repented of your sins, if you haven't turned from your old life, turn from it. Believe in Jesus. Remember, believing is not just acknowledging, okay, I, I like what the preacher said. That's not what it is. Believing is to actually trust, to rely, and to lean. Right? If you say you believe in Jesus, you got to follow him. Not only on Sunday at 2 p.m. Right? Not only on Sunday at 2 p.m. 24 7. 24 7. Because you've been convinced now. This is, he has he has the water. I'm going to go where the water is. This is what he's saying. Number two, he says, read and meditate on the word of God. Read and meditate on the word of God. Remember, Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So you read the word. This is the mouth of God. What's in here? This, John 6 talks about this. See, there's people who just read just to learn. Or there's people who read the Bible, so they go to God. So Jesus says, he's talking to a bunch of religious people who like don't have a relationship, but they read the Bible only. He says, you search the scriptures, thinking that there's life in them. He says, but I say to you, the scriptures are pointing to me. They're talking about me. And you refuse to come to me so that you may have life. The Bible is supposed to lead you to God. See, this is why when I read this passage, I call to God, oh Lord, you love me like this. See, this is how you take it to prayer when you read the Bible. Lord, I love how you love the Samaritan woman to show us who you're like. You take that to God and say, Lord, thank you for loving me in the same way, for being my God. This is how you take the word of God and go to prayer. Right? Christianity is not just about coming to church and doing it's a relationship. More than a religion, it's a relationship with God. It's a relationship with your creator. So as I end today's message, let me I'll leave you with this. Life offers many things that they promise can fill you. They they promise. 
see people on TV, they want to be famous. Some people, they want the house with the car, with all of that. That doesn't satisfy you. That doesn't do it. And some of you know that already. But neither does drugs, alcohol, nothing like that will satisfy you. And you know that already. See? But it's one thing to know this is bad. It's another thing to know this is the good and you go drink that from what's good. Now you know what's good. Now you know what's good. You've all read this now, right? You all got eyes and ears, right? You know where the fountain is. So what I want to leave you is go drink from that fountain. And you won't need me or my master or anything like that. The Holy Spirit will be given to you. You have the word of God. You'll be able to pray and have a right relationship with God. Yeah. And that will create whether you are in whatever situation you're in, you'll have life and joy. Amen. That's the beauty. So drink the water that Jesus gives you and go to the right fountain every day. Let me pray for all of you. Dear Father, thank you so much for this time that we get to gather for worship. Because through this worship, we're able to hear from you, from your word, from the Bible, and have you left these truths so that many people, thousands of years later after this happened, can still learn from it. Lord, we've learned that everyone who drinks from the well of this world will be thirsty again. But everyone who drinks the water that you give them will never thirst and that water will be in them and create a spring in them that wells up to eternal life. Father, may you bestow mercy and grace on each and every person here which you know by name. That they may be in right relationship with you. That they seek you through the Bible. They seek you through your word and pray to you. And may that relationship, that restored relationship with you create that spring water in them and may that also bless those around them may their response be the same as that samaritan woman that day where she left her jar and she joyfully started telling everyone about jesus even her enemies lord we love you and we know from scripture that we love you because you loved us first help us love others in the same way in jesus name we pray amen, amen.